John Eberhardt, and we're here for Veterans Project. With me today is Ed Gorman. Uh, Ed was with the uh, Normandy invasion. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Um, when you uh, you were born, when and where? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, in 1924. 1924, and you went into the uh, army. I went into the army in 19 late 1942. And you were enlisted, or did you get that? I enlisted. That I tried to enlist right after Pearl Harbor was bombed. In fact, my the best buddy, Pat Esposito, and I, and then another friend, Bill Yowen, tried to enlist at the same time. And that's when this, the lines were around this, the corner, those blocks long, waiting to enlist. And unfortunately, I was only 17 and a half, and I needed my parents' consent. My dad's a World War I veteran, and I had an older brother who was, also had, already had a draft number. And they sort of said, well, you know, maybe you ought to finish school first. And so they, they talked me out of it. Both of us, both Patty and I, his parents said the same thing. And so we waited. And then finally, after we were old enough and, you know, realized that uh, the war was going to be around for a long time, and my parents finally consented. And my dad and mom really didn't want to. But they said, okay. And then I was 18 when I enlisted. But you were persistent. You were going to go. Oh, yeah, we were going to go. Yeah, he and I were going to go. to Patty and I were going to go together. <laughs> and we did, you know, for the first couple of weeks. And then we went out to, uh, after we enlisted, we were sent to Fort Dix for indoctrination for a couple of weeks and get some equipment. And then they shipped us out to Camp Crowder, Missouri. Of course, we joined the Signal Corps. Okay. And then while we were at Camp Crowder, Missouri, after our basic training, was, that's where we took our basic training, uh, they sent us to specialized school. They sent Pat to wire school to be a lineman, and then he sent me to radio school. So you're and a radio I, operator then? I was a radio operator. I, they sent me down to Port Arthur, Texas, to Port Arthur College, and I was down there for 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks, in training, learning all about radio communications. But fortunately, I knew some of the uh, code, Morse code, because of my Boy Scout training. Patty and I were both in the Boy Scouts together. And that's wow. why we chose the Signal Corps. Oh, excellent, excellent. So now, um, you crossed the Atlantic. Yes. After your training. After training here. And where, where were you before the landing? Well, before the landing and even before we left to go uh, overseas, because the type of a unit that I was finally assigned to was called the 294th JASCO, Joint Assault Signal Company, and then it became Joint Assault Special Communications Operations. Okay. And there were five such units like that in the whole United States Army. There was an idea of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to form these specialized units who would be amphibious trained, meaning amphibious invasion trained. And our specialty was landings and supplying the total communications operations for an amphibious landing. And we were a unique unit because when I left Texas, there were 12 of us that left the, the school that we attended, and we arrived at Camp Bradford, Virginia. It was a naval base, and we were only the only 12 Army men on the naval base, and the commandant of the base wanted to know what we were doing there. <laughs> and I, I had the orders for us, and little did he realize it, evidently. But then the rest of my outfit started to arrive the next day, and then finally our CAD, we arrived and they got everything all squared away. But that first night, they didn't know where to put us. They wanted to send us off the base. But fortunately, they found a place for us to sleep. So you were Navy steps on for, for Basically, that, that's, why, that's why I say, you know, <laughs> when people kid about the Army and the Navy, I'm, I was just as much Navy as I was Army because I say that 60% of my time in the Army was spent on board some kind of a ship, whether it was wow. a landing craft or a ship traveling from one place to another. So now you crossed the Atlantic. We crossed the Atlantic. How long did you wait before that you got the call that it was going to happen? We, we crossed the Atlantic in uh, late fall, November, like around November of 1943. And we were stationed at a camp in Swansea, Wales called Camp Singleton. And there we did more training because everywhere we went, we basically had to do training with the components of our our outfit, which were all specialized. We were, we were assigned to the 5th Engineer Brigade, Special Brigade. And these, this was the outfit that was trained to go in pre-dawn 
and pre-landing, first, first wave landing, to dismantle whatever uh, defenses that they could uh, underwater, above water, before the invasion, you know, the, the actual first wave started or landed. So our training was with them, and then we were assigned, as the, the brigade was assigned to the 1st Division, 1st first, first Division Engineers. And so we trained, while we were in Wales, we trained with the various units of the, the total invasion force uh, in practice a number of times. And as I say, I was on on water as much as I was on land quite often. And uh, we, we trained almost one week out of a month, or sometimes even more, on the practice landings until the invasion. Now the word came down. How did the word get to you that it was going to happen? We, they, we just got our, our so-called shipping orders. Okay. They, they gave us our orders to pack up and, and get waterproof, so to speak. So then you knew. And then we knew. And we were in Weymouth, England, and we, take, we uh, were uh, transported over to a, a rendezvous base, so to speak, a rendezvous point, and then before we boarded the ships. Now, we actually boarded the ships on June 2nd of 1944 because the invasion was supposed to be on June 4th but because of the weather we had already set sail on June 3rd and it got so bad out in the channel that we had to turn around and come back in and then the big decision was now do we keep all of these troops on board the ships or do we take them off and then what about the element of surprise they were, these are things that I've heard afterwards sure. of course but they were worried about the element of surprise and everything else and at the time, I guess the Germans must have had some inkling of something taking place. But we did sail. They decided to keep us on board the ships. And at the first break in the weather, we would set sail for the, for the shores of France. And they were prepared for, the, for your arrival, the Germans? To a great extent, they were. They were and they weren't. They, they really didn't know where we were going to land. They had an idea that we were going to hit the, the uh, shores of France or somewhere along the coastline. I can just imagine, maybe if you can just take me back a little bit, what your feeling was as soon as that platform lowered and you knew, I'm running ashore. Well, there are some preliminary things prior to that, John. Uh, first of all, we were all told that we had to be ready at 2 o'clock in the morning for the final. That's when we found out really where we were going, okay. to tell you the truth. Even though I was a team leader, and <clears throat> the officers of my, my company, my command, uh, thought they knew, but they didn't get the actual orders until about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we had a, a staff meeting, and they told us where we were, go were going and where we were landing and what our assignment was. And at the last minute, my particular unit, my particular team, was transferred from going over the side of the ship down the ladders into a Higgins boat okay. to what they call a rhino ferry. And a rhino ferry was basically nothing more than a flat barge, maybe about 24 feet long and 30 some odd, 40, maybe 36 or 40 feet long. And it was wide open. It was, it was constructed of uh, a series of uh, air tanks. Thank God for that. Yes. And we, we boarded that. My assignment at the last minute was from the assault team that I was originally assigned to with the, with the uh, infantry unit to land a second wave in the Higgins boat. I was assigned with it. They, they pulled this one particular team off that I was on, and they assigned us to the brigade headquarters team. And again, we, we uh, boarded, as I said, about 4 o'clock in the morning. And this Higgins boat, I mean this Rhino Ferry, and that, they, they rightly named because it only do six or eight knots. You being an old Navy man know how fast that is. Yeah. It mean how slow. But uh, we were scheduled to land at 6.50 in the morning. That's, that's so you figure from 4 o'clock to... Of course, you have the rendezvous points on, on the way in. It's still all. a long ride. It's still. And it's a, it's a, it was a slow ride, you know. So 
what happened was because of the the resistance that the first waves first wave in particular and even the second wave hit at the beach and the beach was backed up so badly because there was just no movement no way of anybody moving on the beach because the defenses were so tremendous that we had to back off and trawl and that's what we did for the most part of the day which then they, they said well we're going to hit at noon on the way in we hit a mine so we had and we couldn't get our ramp down so we had to back off from that and we trolled some more and we were under heavy fire while we were out there trolling because we were only about three quarters of a mile or so off the beach we could see a lot of what was going on at the beach and we wanted to you know we we felt like sitting ducks out there because stuff was flying all around we us and uh, we were trying to talk to our, our coxman into, you know, going head on in. He said, no. And we were the communications teams, and we could hear a lot of what was going on. There was a lot of coded stuff that we couldn't decipher. But he had his orders, and he knew what the, what the code of the day was and everything else. And he knew that he had to back off and control. And, and while we were trolling, we, we were under pretty heavy fire. And... Uh, there was a British destroyer that came along and laid down a smoke screen for us, which really saved us because uh, the fire from the beach, the German fire from the beach was just tremendous. And we were under that smoke screen for a couple of hours back and forth. Okay. And uh, finally we, we got the ramp fixed, but again the beach was so crowded we couldn't, they wouldn't let us come in. When they did finally let us uh, head to shore, it was dusk, really getting dark. We had another mine. In the meantime, we were strafed by a couple of, of German airplanes and dropped a, a rack of bombs on either side of us. It was oh, like a God. Fourth of July thing. And uh, we, uh, you know, when, when that was happening to us, you know, all of us would just get us the heck out of here. Let us get on shore, you know, because we could see and hear a lot of what was going on on shore. Like you said you were a sitting duck. We were sitting ducks. So we finally landed, and uh, they had to clear space for us, and, and we landed late, late evening, almost dark. And uh, uh, fortunately, we still had all of, our, all of our equipment because we met some of our our other teams uh, when we landed, particularly one officer, uh, Lieutenant Cooper, Hooper rather, and he's the one that guided us into the beach, and he and my particular the officer, Lieutenant Berry, were very close friends, and fortunately, they had walkie-talkies that enabled us to them to communicate and get us into the beach. And uh, they needed our equipment real bad because they, everybody, most of, the, most of the communications teams, of course, we had wiremen as well as radio operators, and they lost a lot of their equipment getting into the beach. We lost some equipment when we when we lost some of our cargo, so to speak, and I use that term loosely, uh, when we hit the mines, you know. Okay. But uh, when, we, when we finally landed, uh, under the cover of darkness, we didn't even set up our radio at the time because there was one operating there, but they needed our equipment in other places, and we became wiremen. We were stringing wire up and down the beach, and, and that's when it really... Yeah. You know, moving, moving through all that heavy fire with wires. The carnage. The, you know, you, you were. Excuse me. It's fine. The, uh, the bodies. And, uh, even though it was dark and uh, what you saw was shadows and, and uh, lighting wasn't that good, but enough, plenty good enough for you to see what, what was going on. blessing in disguise. And, uh, and we just had to, you know, work around all of that. And as you know, Omaha Beach was the hardest hit beach. That was the heviest in hit. In the invasion. And there were thousands lost that day. And, and they were still floating in the water. Now, your mission, 
your, your radio, its, its purpose was to our, guard our mission fire was a complete. Our, our, our particular mission was a complete communications of the whole beachhead. We oh. controlled everything in and off the beach, up in the air. Our, our special unit consisted of not only Signal Corps people, Army Signal Corps, but also Army uh, artillery uh, advanced communications teams. Air Force advanced communications teams and Navy communications. Well, so you teams. were the ears of the pretty so much we, the entire We were the landing. ears, basically, of, of the complete landing, and we covered everything from the sky onto the ground and from shore to offshore. So you direct everything fire in and, and everything. Wow. We we um, we had, you know, our people were inserted or uh, insurgents with the the infantry, the artillery. Uh, Air Force, unfortunately, uh, in, in spite of all of the tremendous bombing that took place at that beach uh, from offshore, from the ships offshore, and, and believe me, when that barrage started at 4 o'clock in the morning, the skies just lit up, and it was just constant bombardment up you until... Did naval ships they had there? They, 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 that they say that there was a total of 5,000 ships involved in the invasion. And they had ships of all sizes, shapes, and forms, from the biggest to the smallest. And there was air support? Well, there was air support, fortunately, from all the other beaches except Omaha. Omaha Beach is the only beach that the Air Force missed. And that's why we took such a beating to it. Of course, there, was, there were no bomb shelters or bomb holes for us to, to, uh, to use as protection. There was just uh, the bare beachhead. There was nothing there. Any, any holes in the beach, we had to dig with our hands or with the spades we had, the little tools we had. Now how long were you actually on the beach itself? I was on the beach all the first night. Of course, we couldn't move. But the first day, crack of dawn, we had to go through because, again, the beach was still loaded with minefields. There were, you know, there were very few trails off the beach except for the one major opening in the beach, and that was the one the big opening that they, they made in the past by Colville Samir, okay. where the big guns were. And thank goodness for the, uh, for the uh, engineers that, that set the, the, the uh, uh, bombs and the, or, or, or the, uh, uh, the dynamite that blew Clear up that hole open, and opened up that bin. That pass was just solidly blocked. But. So I'm assuming, did, did, there, was there, did you get any sleep at all that night? Or? I didn't sleep for almost 64 hours. No sleep that night, no sleep the next night. And uh, we set up our communications right there at, at the opening of, of uh, where you saw in any of the movies where they, they blew the bandolier uh, mm -hmm. discharges and blew open that space. That's where we set up with the brigade headquarters. So we were right there, yeah. and the town was like from here uh, up to uh, St. George Avenue. Stone's you know. throw away. That's right, uh, yeah. And you know, you, you see pictures of that, the mayor of that town running out in his underwear. Well, that was a guy that ran. <laughs> he was in that town that we, we landed by, you know. And so we, we were there uh, for a while, and I guess it was D plus two late in the afternoon because each day they said there was going to be a uh, and there was a counter attack that we had to be watching out for and be on the alert for, and then we would get strafed every day by a couple of the German airplanes that were still flying, even though there weren't that many. And I finally said to my guys, "Guys, I got to get some sleep." And so uh, there was a, uh, a damaged uh, jeep sitting on the side of the road. And I said, I'm going to go sit in the jeep and see if I can get some sleep. And I was sitting in the jeep sleeping, actually, when, when Bill, Billy Weingartner, this real good buddy, he was one of my team men, he was my number two man, come over and he's, he's yelling at me, get out of the jeep, get out of the jeep, get out of the jeep. And I'd say, nah, nah, I would I, didn't even, I was so tired, and what it was, I was being strafed and didn't really know. Oh, my God, so you were tired. So I, I just rolled over, rolled under the Jeep, and he jumped onto there with me. Oh, you so know. you slept while people were shooting at you. Yeah, well, we tried to anyway, you oh, know, wow. because we were so tired. But uh, 
and then you know we we remained uh, in France and and our unit got reorganized and and we proceeded to go inland uh, with our units, uh, with our teams and so forth in support of the 1st Division as they went through uh, that part of France into the Battle of St. Lowe. Now, you, the, the beach was secured? The, the beach was secured to a point because the Germans weren't that far away. Okay. Uh, St. Lowe is what, about uh, 13, 14 miles from the beachhead, <laughs> something like that, very close to the beachhead. And we were, we were stopped there. Now, the townspeople, when they had to know by now, well, but you're the Americans. Oh, yeah, no, the townspeople were tremendously supportive, you know. And those that had been supportive of the Vosh, as they called it, you know, they, they took them out and they treated them somewhat shamefully, you yes. know. And we had, don't, we captured a lot of Germans. We captured an awful lot of Germans, and they kept bringing them back to the beachhead, and then we, you know, they kept them uh, sort of contained at the beach until they could put them on ships and get them back to, to England or where they were going to send them to, okay. to the camps. You know, but there was information, camps. hopefully, in these Germans. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. We had a, a little incident. In, it was about the early morning of D plus two, I guess it was, and they kept talking about the counterattacks. And a couple of our guys, this one fellow in particular, Ben Edden, his name was, about six foot six. He was, he was bigger fellows, he, he could curl up into a, like a snake and become so small it wasn't even funny. And he and his fellow Bill DeLong were on duty. And we sort of, you know, our, our jobs were, were, while we were specialists in one field, like radio operators and so forth, or, or wiremen, but we also, you know, when somebody was working and we were riflemen protecting them. You were a soldier also. We were a soldier, yeah. right. And they were on guard duty this day, protecting the unit, the team. And they noticed this, this little uh, movement. And they said, what the heck is that? And what it was was a sniper. Because we kept hearing the sniper fire. And we didn't know where the heck it was coming from. And this guy was in a hole in the ground. Oh, my gosh. And they saw him. And they went over and they flipped that lid of that thing open. And there he was. A young Thank kid. God. There were a lot of young German. They were kids, you know. Yeah. And even... When we got oh, off you the were beach, a kid, Ed. I was only 20 years yeah. old, just 20, yeah. And we um, we had to be very, very careful because the Germans were, they set booby traps like you wouldn't believe. And when we took over the the bluff where the, the guns and the and the enforcements were, the machine gun and uh, emplacements and and uh, the trenches that ran from one end of the beach clear to the other, you could. You could walk from one end of, of uh, Omaha Beach to the other end of Omaha Beach without even showing your head. That's how fortified it was. Oh, they were fortified. And they were in and out, you know, the trenches and, and, and the, the dugouts that they had were down maybe one or two stories below surface. And, you know, that it, it was really a, a, an underground home. And everything was booby-trapped. That's oh. where, the, again, the engineers had to go in there and and dismantled so many booby traps. And we, you know, we wanted to use those uh, trenches and all for protection, but we couldn't go in there. You I, didn't know I, what you'd find. Yeah. I, I, I say, I, my team, we set up our radio in, in a, on, the, on the side of the bluff in, in a, a little cave. And then at night, we, you know, during the day we'd bring it out, but at night we'd bring it in for protection. And... Uh, uh, we were there for, oh, I was in that position for about a week until they moved us. And uh, as we advanced in France, brigade headquarters would move it up a little bit, and then we would move up with them. And so our, our unit uh, stayed in France throughout the, the, uh, the winning of, of St. Lowe. The, the Battle of St. Lo, and then after that, they uh, had us pulled back to the beachhead, and we were assigned the responsibility of setting up the complete communications system from where we were <coughs> in Normandy, completely all the way down to Cherbourg <coughs> for the, for the uh, Allied headquarters, yeah. So now you had just 
landed in Normandy, just, yeah. just taken, for all intents and purposes, recaptured France from, from the Germans, yeah. or to set things well underway. But apparently the army wasn't done with you yet. No, no. no. They decided that, that Ed Gorman and company is yeah, needed somewhere else. In, along around October, uh, late October, early November, we had uh, received orders to secure in France and pull back. We were being sent back to England and for reorganization, so to speak. And we thought we were going to get ready to make another invasion somewhere else in Europe. And while we were in England, the Battle of the Bulge broke out. I had a brother in the Battle of the Bulge. I didn't know it at the really? time. Yeah, my older brother, Jim. The one I thought <laughs> wouldn't be drafted. He got drafted three months after I after you enlisted. After I enlisted, yeah. At any rate, he was in the Battle of the Bulge, and, and the Battle of the Bulge broke out. And this was around the middle of December. And we thought, sure, that we were going to be shipping being shipped back over into Europe somewhere, over to the mainland, and uh, become a part of that, you know, that force to protect and, and, and fight in the Battle of the Bulge. But they said, no, you have your orders, and you're being re uh, reassigned, rotated, reorganized, you're being sent back to the United States. So we said, well, wow, good, yeah. good deal. Yeah. You know? We thought we were being sent back to become cadre or, or training for somebody else because, as I said, there are only five, five outfits like our outfit. It's in pretty the whole elite. And, and, if, and another uh, strange coincidence with the number five, there were only five Rhino ferries in the whole invasion, and I was on one of them. The one that got hit. That one that Two. got hit. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I'll tell you well, a little bit later to talk about my return to France, but at any rate... They sent us back to the United States, and then when we got back to the United States, they got, we had our travel orders to report to Camp Callum out in La Jolla, California. That's not a good sign. No. And that's when we found out we were being shipped to the South Pacific. And we were the first unit to be rotated and assigned to the South Pacific. So we, you know, we, we have the distinction, if you want to call it that, of having served in both theaters of operation. Which is, yeah, that's extremely rare. Right. I mean, you had just taken Normandy. Right. Uh, a, a huge success, a yeah. huge cost of lives, mm -hmm. and now they're asking you now to do right. the same thing in Japan. Yeah. In fact, we were, we were on board the Queen Mary uh, returning home during the Christmas holidays in 1944, and I have some... Uh, you know, so, some souvenirs of that because I have a copy of the menu that we had on Christmas Day on board that ship. It looked like the menu. But yeah, I saw yeah, the menu. It's and, some great food. And, and, and then Herman Lehman, who was, who was uh, an ambassador at the time, was on board the ship too, and then he became governor, governor. of New York. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we went over on the Mauritania out of Nova Scotia, all alone, unescorted by any submarines or or, milita or you know, naval vessels. We came back from Europe on a Queen Mary, uh, and again, uh, all alone, uh, without any no escort. escort or anything like that, because the boat ships could travel faster than any of the escorts. Yeah, they're serious. So fish. we were very fortunate. Yeah. Very fast. But and you didn't have to. Something occurred, and I'll yeah, we, uh, your feelings again, on that. We, when we got out to California, they reorganized us. We had to, you know, replenish our our personnel. We had lost some personnel and so forth. So they they strengthened our unit, and, and we had a lot of new assignees come on board and train with them. So again, we were back into training, and we shipped over to Hawaii. We were in uh, Oahu, Hawaii, and out again out far into the beat of the island with a naval base. Again, more <laughs> practice landings up and down the ropes. And uh, then we had just come back from a, a major exercise on the main, uh, the big island of Hawaii, and we were all waterproofed and loaded up because when, you, when you're in training and you go into all the training and, uh, and your exercises, you know, you're waterproofing all of your equipment, you're extending the, the exhaust pipes on your Jeeps, and, and you, you know, you're 
waterproofing your radio equipment and everything else. So we, we were all set. Uh, we thought we were finished with the exercise and we were coming back up to shore and coming back to camp when they said, no, stay on board. We go, oh, not again. That can't, start. that can't be good. So sure enough, and this was in August. And while we were on board uh, the ship, we thought we were going to set sail from Honolulu Harbor when uh, they dropped the bomb. And so... Uh, we stayed on board ship for the next 48 hours till they realized that Japan was going to surrender. And you heard that they had just dropped this They dropped the bombs. And we were, we were really uh, assigned and ready to set sail for an advanced base, probably Okinawa or some of it, somewhere close to there for the invasion of Japan. So I'm We knew that was going to come. Guessing everyone on board that ship was thanking Harry Truman. Yeah, we, we absolutely. Because... We, well, we took, and we were very fortunate in my outfit, where we only had about 20 to 23% casualties from Normandy. We anticipated a lot more. In Japan, it would have been. For Japan, because, you know, uh, it was, you know, it was predicted it was going to be a real fierce fight. Serious fight. So we were very fortunate. Yeah. So now, some 50 years later, yeah. Ed Gorman, someone contacts Ed. Yeah. Says, yeah I, uh, I happened to be on a committee. Uh, I guess it was a, a state committee, and the federal committees were organized all across the country to uh, put together programs to remember and celebrate various important dates during World War II, Pearl Harbor, Iwo Jima, D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, uh, the uh, Surrender of Japan. And I f was on that committee for three years. And while I was on that committee, uh, I became friendly with a couple of guys. And a couple of years after that, for the 55th anniversary of... Normandy, the D-Day invasion of Normandy, Regional News Network wanted to do a documentary on D-Day and talk about the VA and, and you know, some of the shortcomings of the VA at the time and the help that was needed by veterans from the VA and from the government for a lot of the veterans that were hurting. And they selected six of us to return to France. Wow, what a treat. There were two from the first, 101st Airborne. There were two from the 82nd Airborne. There was one from the first uh, division engineers and then myself from the, the special That's an elite crowd you were with. Yes, <clears throat> very much so. And so they did Regional News Network and that whole French family, just absolutely wonderful to us, and took us back to France, back to Normandy, and they recorded and documented each of our participations at the various beaches or, or towns or, or communities in, in Normandy that we, you know, uh, landed on. One, one, of a, one of our 80, 101st Airborne fellows, Joe Pisano, he, all his training was glider training. And recognizing the problem with the gliders and, and the way they had the protection of the fields, in the fields uh, for those glider planes, they pulled him off at the last minute, and he landed by boat in the Higgins boat on Utah okay. Beach. Uh, now you saw something there too that was very interesting. It was yes, uh, we we they had a regular program for us each day, and the, the one particular day, one of the first ceremonies we attended was at Point de Hoc. and while we were attending the services there, and, and the French were absolutely wonderful to us. There's stories I could tell about that. But I happened to look down onto the beach because I was telling, they knew, the people the, the, in the group knew that I came over and I landed on the, uh, at the D-Day in a Rhino ferry. And down on the beach at Point to Hook, the only craft that we saw, the whole shoreline of Normandy was a a rhino ferry rhino. with the two holes in it that just like where the right yes. you know, center beam and then 
a starboard bow. Holy cow. Yeah, and it was odd, the one I was on, and I have pictures of it. And it, it, what a feeling it brought back, I'll tell you. I couldn't I believe imagine. it. imagine, yeah. Yeah. To, to be the one that was there. Yep. And, and I imagine it's staying there as a remembrance of that day. I made, I, I don't know if it's still, that was now 10 years ago. It would be 10 years ago this okay. June. And then uh, we each did, you know, they taped us and interviewed us. And each part of the beachhead that we, you know, uh, landed on and they, they, Taped me over on the bluff overlooking all of, of uh, Omaha Beach, where I landed. Which is a pretty beach now. Oh yeah, they got all Beautiful. condominiums and it's just you know, they have a golf course there. And, Wasn't like that. But they were. also have that big cemetery and blessed Now name. there's a great picture of you uh, at that cemetery playing tribute uh, to your uh, yes your fellow soldiers and excellent picture. Uh, there's over 9,000 men. 9,000. And you, and you mentioned 23% as being not bad. Right. That's tremendous. But the losses on Omaha Beach were just tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. And uh, it was quite a sight because as I stood on that bluff overlooking the beach, you could still see the gun emplacements. Wow. The outline of them in the, in the ground and the trench that ran from one end of the beach and just, because, you know, it, it, it's, the outline is still there. You could just see all of that stuff. And when you're standing, when I was standing there then, because back in 44, uh, after D-Day, and we had taken the beach, you know, and we were up on the bluffs, there was so much activity going on on the beach. I'd, Personnel coming in, ships coming in, ships landing, personnel coming uh, up the, the trails and up, up uh, through the pass and tracks, uh, all kinds of vehicles moving. You know, it was just one tremendous uh, beachhead of activity. But then to see it when I did in 1999. Quieter place. Quiet and serene. And you could see the, the clear shot that the, that the Germans had of us on that whole beachhead. It is scary when you Every, look at those pictures uh, that really, they could, you were literally seeing ducks. Right. Absolutely. And it's, uh, uh, it's easy to see why we took such a beating that we did because there wasn't an inch of that beach that wasn't covered. They could see everything. They could see every single inch of that beach from every vantage point. And, and, and they had the, they had the, the, Firepower. Personnel and the firepower to do it. Yeah. You mentioned they had one of the cannons, which is a, it's on rails or on the rails. Yeah, the, one of the big, one fifty five or whatever it was. That's big. Tremendously big, and it would roll out on railroad tracks and fire, and then recoil and roll back in. And they had the doors on on this uh, gun emplacement. The, 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 the walls were at least 12 to 14 feet thick. And when our shells were just bouncing off it from the ships, we were hitting that thing like crazy, but they were just bouncing on their steel doors. And fortunately, one of our advanced um, artillery teams, one of, one of the groups, timed the uh, firing and, and recoiling of that, that gun, and we caught it when the doors were open. And that's the only reason why that gun was knocked out of Wow, good thinking. And we were lucky, because that's the sucker that was shooting at me. <laughs> and I was <laughs> sitting out there like a, you know... Uh, good timing. Duck good thinking. On, on water. Yeah, we were sitting, sitting ducks out there. So now... And I don't know who that kid was or who that, that person was, but I thank him every day. What about a cup of coffee you could have found? Yes, him. yes. Uh, now... The war's over. Yeah. Ed Gorman gets to come home. Yep. How did you get back home? Well, right after the the, uh, uh, the declaration of uh, the war ending and the signing of the documents, they broke up my outfit. And uh, as I said, we were a specialized unit. So they dispersed us to various Signal Corps companies or battalions around. And when it came time for me to be rotated back home or discharged, 
I came home on board a Liberty ship that could only do 9 to 11 knots an hour. It floats like a cork. Uh-huh. And I went from Hawaii all the way around by way of the Panama Canal all the way to the East Coast. 31 days on board that ship. Today that would be a luxury cruise, but oh, back I then you, in a Liberty ship. The, under, the only good thing about it is I was able to get work. My dad was a stevedore, and uh, he had access to a lot of the the, per, the uh, Burt's and, 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 and the, the piers in Brooklyn. And he, I told him what the type of ship I was on, he was able to find out. And he was there to meet me on board that that pier and got a got in a in fact, Navy yeah, we were supposed to stay out in the harbor because it was a weekend but he got us in on that Saturday and thank God for that yeah <coughs> and you know and it was good to get home and your reception here the welcome from yeah you know back in those days we had the Blue Star program going all over the country and we're gonna get into that because yeah. that's a great thing and so on the street that I live in, just on the one street, we called it a block in Brooklyn. Yep. Just on that one street, there were 37 guys in the army or the military. And, you know, and uh, only two didn't come home. But when you came home, everybody on the street turned out. You know, we, they had a big uh, monument displayed, a handmade monument where they had the names of everybody and so forth and uh, sort of like a shrine thing. Big welcome. Yeah, and so everybody turned out to welcome you home. Yeah. Good. My friends, all my, my buddy Patty got home safe and Good. all the other friends I had. Of course, a lot of the guys that I went into the service or that were in the service were all kids in the same Boy Scout troop. And you know, there were two long streets. You know, on one, one particular block, there were 13 of us that belonged to the same troop, and all went in. And again, you were fairly active with the Boy Scouts afterwards yeah, well, also. Yeah, I did. I went back to uh, work at the National Headquarters and then became a member of the National Staff of the Boy Scouts. It's yeah. a great organization. Yes, it is. Great yes. organization. Now, uh, I'm going to quickly hurl you up to today. And You had mentioned the Blue Star family. There's some things there and, uh, that you've personally done, Ron Davies has done with the Blue Star group. One in particular is a gentleman, I don't want to mention his name, who was injured in Iraq and he applied for disability and got a low percentage. And both you and Ron, I think you're, you're saying Jack something McGreevy about... Jack McGreevy, too. And Jack McGreevy, yes. Jack McGreevy, yes. McGreevy uh, tremendous help. You're veterans He's helping ready. veterans. Right. And you really push this, and, and I think this is just amazing. Right now, that young ex-sergeant now has 100% disability. The VA is taking care of them, so... Uh, well, to a point they are, and very, you know, and, and, and uh, doing a, a, a good job, you know, a fairly good job, but he's entitled to more, and we're working on getting And you're going to go, yeah. We're, we're, you're we're not still working on that case. No, it's, uh, you know, th there's a lot uh, of fellows like him. I see him up at the VA all the time, right, up at East Orange in particular. But thank goodness the governor's aware of it now, and as I mentioned before, the documentary that RNN did, we were having trouble with the VA in getting, you know, people covered from the Vietnam War and as well as Korea and, and even World War II. Desert Storm. And, and so we, we, the documentary sort of opened their eyes, and we were able to, to get them to realize that the Vision 3, which is a New York, New Jersey area, were being shortchanged in a lot of things as far as the veterans were concerned. And they, they made a lot of good changes. It's still, you know, nothing is ever perfect as such, but they are trying hard, and they're, they're doing a much better job today. And really, rightfully so, particularly for these young kids today that, that are serving our, our nation so admirably. Uh, I have such admiration for them are. and such high respect we for them. We have such a great future generation ahead of we us. We do. We really do. Yeah. The uh, Blue Star family, and again, you have monthly meetings with the families. Right, Just to give everyone an idea of how it operates, it's the families, moms, dads, moms, spouses. Moms, dads, right, all get together at our post one day a month, and they just talk to each other. Uh, the one I, I was at one, and we were discussing the uh, anthrax vaccination, how it was affecting some of the right. soldiers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a, every one of them walked out of that meeting saying, wow, I got a lot. Yes. 
You know, the, the thing that I admire so much about the group today is their meeting. See, I mentioned before about the street I lived on in Brooklyn, and there were 30, 34, 37 of us that, that went into the service. And, you know, we were next door neighbors. We lived in the same apartment buildings or the, the house across the street. These folks are spread out all over the township, all over the, the various communities in, in between Union County and Middlesex County. And they come together once a month to support each other, to talk to each other, to share their, their experiences that they're having with their sons and daughters, uh, to find out ways and means that they can help get uh, more help and, and information to their, to their children. And the, the thing that amazes me is the communications today, being a communications person, I am so amazed at the quick communications that they have today with their children overseas. Yes. They Cell talk to them almost every day or weekly. You know, we, we talked about Normandy. And somebody mentioned before about, well, when did you write home or whatever. I don't know when it was I wrote home, but the, when I got back home, my aunt told me a story about when she found out that when we all lived in the same apartment building, my grandmother on one floor, an aunt and another, cousin on another, there were eight families and we had five of the, the uh, uh, five families living in, in, you know. Five of the eight the, were there. Or the eight were our, our family. And this one aunt happened to hear about the invasion in Normandy. And, and this was later on, you know, and she said, uh, to my mother, Louise, she said, they just invaded France. And my mother says, so what? She said, well, Buddy is over there. She said, no, Buddy is in Wales. He's not over in, in France, you know. So she, when she found out <laughs> about two or three months later that I, I was part of the invasion, oh. Oh, yeah. But today uh, it's instant. Yes. That, that, that's the thing I admire about the communication system today and, the, and these families. It, they are so supportive and, and, and so dedicated to helping each other. And, and we feel honored that you know, we're able to make our, our post home available to them for their meetings to you know, just uh, good uh, have, their, have their meetings and talk about the things that they, they talk about. And they need to talk Try about. to get them the help that they, they're looking for, bring in the people from the military or from the government to... Uh, try to answer their questions and, and uh, you know, get them the information that they're seeking and, and continue to uh, uh, look out for their children and things like that, yeah. And we've grown, we've, we're up to well over 45 families now. It's a huge now. group. And they're just growing every month, yeah. Now, Ed, and this has been interesting, and I, I know you don't like to hear this, and you keep saying this over and over again, but in my mind, I'm sure in a lot of people's minds, you're, you're a hero in our books and uh, yeah you're a hero yeah. ladies and gentlemen uh, we'll be back we'll uh, with hopefully some more stories of our veterans around Woodbridge thank you